romance is one of the cornerstones of Winx Club's story. Though it's often kept to subplots, fans often enjoy seeing how these romantic relationships develop and change over the course of the series. That said, it can also get grating very quickly, especially when it comes to poor character writing, stale chemistry, or just plain toxicity for the sake of arbitrary drama. Today we're going to be talking about each of the main couples shown throughout the series and weighing their pros and cons, ranking them accordingly. I also want to preface that we'll only be talking about canon romantic relationships each of the Winks have had, so we will not be discussing any relationships or love interests outside of them. So no Tricy, got that name, nor Murda X Lucy or Palladium X Avalon, even though we all know they are gay as hell and totally have had their weddings off screen. Now without further ado, let the games begin. My Taylor Swift references know no bounds. A lot of people complain about Aisha and Roy's romance because they feel Aisha wasn't given enough time to move on after Naboo's death. And while I definitely understand where that critique is coming from, I also feel it's a bit of a misunderstanding of the grieving process. Grief looks different for everyone. It's entirely possible for Aisha to still grieve Naboo while also feeling able to try a romantic relationship whenever she feels ready. There's no set timeline for these things. And she also made it clear during the party in season 5 that she wasn't a fan of Stella trying to set her up with a couple random guys, to which Roy respectfully backed off because he noted it was a bad moment to try and approach her. My issues with this couple are largely in the fact that they have the chemistry of a glass of stagnant water. There's no real reason given for these two to like each other aside from Roy's superficial sportiness and affinity for water to tie into Aisha's personality and powers. It would be nice to see these two bond over their experiences, like how Aisha and Naboo did back in Season 3, and seeing how Aisha processed that after having lost him. Aisha would probably have had a lot of work to go through before starting a new relationship, but none of that gets addressed. It's less the speed at which she moves on that bothers me, and more the fact there's no effort put into it on the writer's part. Not to mention, Roy himself has almost no character beyond the qualities I mentioned plus the one spell he has to let him breathe underwater. Which, cool, but it also feels like a way to lazily connect him to Naboo being a sorcerer. We know nothing about Roy's past, experiences, or personality, and as such, we're not given a reason to root for this couple. And that's why they're at the very bottom of the list. We just aren't given enough information to work with to get behind these two as a pairing. And it could have gone in so many interesting ways to show Aisha's growth as she moves on and heals that it feels like a complete waste of potential and waste of time. It's fairly common knowledge that Musa and Riven's relationship is incredibly turbulent. In fact, that turbulence is probably the first thing most Winx fans think of when they're asked about these two as a couple. A lot of people consider them to be the most quote-unquote realistic relationship because of this turbulence, but that's actually a very dangerous misconception of what a realistic relationship looks like. If a relationship is this volatile with severe highs and lows, then that is not healthy, which is a point we will get into in a little while. I think their dynamic was at its most interesting in the first two or three seasons, like almost everything else in this franchise. Musa had a crush on Riven back in the first season, but he wound up becoming a minor antagonist when Darcy and the Tricks manipulated him into becoming their errand boy. Musa quickly got over him, with only a hint of the crush at the end of season one. Season two then focused on a strange but strong bond between these two, where it's clear that they do care about each other, but they're not exactly sure how they feel, and you bet your ass neither of them is going to talk about it openly. Oh no. Musa mentions during a sleepover that she's not sure Riven would like a tomboy like her, which I'm not sure how I feel about. I personally feel like Musa would have more confidence in herself, and given she gets her charm mixed by trusting Riven, 
I kind of feel like a more understandable and consistent concern is learning to trust Riven after how he acted throughout season one. Season three gets weird though, with Musa wanting to end things given Riven's behavior and lack of chemistry, and then suddenly Musa's on board because Riven was willing to fight over her, which, um, I'm, I'm not even going into that, nope. And the movie is also weird, with Riven getting poisoned by Mondragora and turned evil, and then nearly killing Musa, followed by Riven breaking free and kiss. I... Okay, alright. And he also just seems like more of a dick than usual in the movie, which, okay. Their relationship seems pretty good at the start of season four, but then once Musa starts pursuing a music career, Riven starts disparaging her and being rude and dismissive while Musa gets weirdly close with Jason Queen as a rebound. At this point, I was just exhausted with their relationship. Even by the time they'd fix things by the end of season four, I stopped caring. Even when Riven got his shit together in season five and wrote a whole song for her, the whole is Riven cheating subplot was so frustrating to deal with. And then in season six, Riven is aloof and too focused on training to give Musa the time of day for no particular reason. It's not because Riven feels Musa can't protect herself, or he's especially worried about what the tricks are capable of. He's just obsessed with training. Okay. It just feels like the writers weren't sure what to do with these two, either than give them obligatory roadblocks every damn season. It honestly felt refreshing when Musa and Riven had that goodbye conversation at the end of season six. It felt like a conversation that should have been ages ago, but better late than never, I suppose. Honestly, this would have been welcome in season four, especially to show them growing up and doing what's best for them, but whatever. It's nice to see something like this happen because it's an acknowledgement that most first relationships don't work out, especially given the rest of the girls, save Aisha, are still with their firsts. Well, I suppose Sky is Bloom's second, but y'all know what I mean. And seeing Musa accept being single in season seven and happy on her own is refreshing. Even that weird little pseudo-romance with Orlando is nice to see, because to me, it reads as proof that Musa is capable of moving on after Riven. And then season eight. Oh God. Suddenly Riven is back out of nowhere and Musa's angry at him, both for being back and also for not contacting her. Even though it was very clear to everyone at the end of season six that Riven was going to be on his own for a long time, potentially, to figure himself out. And that also, everyone was going to be welcoming to him whenever he chose to return. And then they just go back on their word. Wonderful. For the most part, I don't mind season eight Riven, aside from that weird spectacle he pulled in the Hydra episode. But I am not a fan of Musa being angry at Riven for seemingly no reason, and everyone else flip-flopping on whether they agree, with both the Winx being angry at Riven's return, and then Aisha deciding she's upset at Musa because she's upset Riven saved her. Like, can y'all make up your damn minds and make this make sense? By the end of season eight, they're back together, which, okay, I guess. I would have just preferred they stay apart, or maybe after a long time they learn to just be friends while not continuing a romance. It could have been a great example of how sometimes relationships just don't work out, even if both people grow from their mistakes. But as is, it's exhausting, and I ain't here for it. Again, it's nice to see Aisha moving on. And as such, I was actually a big fan of Aisha and Nex in season six. The love triangle is annoying, especially given it's not clear whether she and Roy are together or not. But that said, I actually really like season six Nex. At first, he seems to be arrogant, wanting to show off and endangering Roy specifically to win Aisha over, backfiring each time. But after getting called out, Nex actually shapes up and tries to do better. For any old school fans who remember the Una Dinoy blog, there was a piece written about Nex as a sort of anti-Riven, specifically as a counter-argument to common discourse comparing Nex to Riven. The general idea is that Nex enjoys teasing others, which at first glance appears very similar to Riven's antagonism. But in reality, Nex means well and he serves as a proper foil to Aisha, especially given his name means death while hers means life. That said, I am not a fan of them getting together without a conversation after season six. Very similar to her and Roy. Although Roy just kind of stops existing and never gets any closure. 
And by season seven, it feels the writers took that complaint about next to heart and made him into a replacement for Riven with him continually being rude and dismissive towards Aisha's choices, especially in regards to Squonk. He's quickly back to his old self in season eight, and it's actually really sweet seeing him trying to be supportive of Aisha in the Andros episodes. And I sincerely wish this made up the majority of their relationship. But again, because of season seven and also the weird season six nonsense, I'm gonna have to keep them down towards the bottom of the list. Still leagues healthier than Musa and Riven, oh my god. Perhaps the most overrated couple of the series. That's right, I said it. Bloom and Sky are a mess and they always kinda have been. That said, I actually really like them in the first three seasons. They're both well-meaning cinnamon rolls who are doing their best and oftentimes step on each other's toes and clash as fellow hotheads, especially in season two. That's really when they work out the kinks in their relationship. A big problem with these two that kind of goes unaddressed is the fact that their dynamic began on a lie. Yes, Skye had to lie about his identity as the Prince of Arachleon to protect himself, and thus couldn't really mention his engagement to Diospro, but you'd think this would leave lingering trust issues that they would have to talk about. Not even gonna touch on the fact Bloom assaulted a young noblewoman in front of a huge crowd, then face no consequences for it whatsoever. But what can you do? And in the movie, Sky's excuse for not explaining why he disappeared for so long and who Discount Diaspora was is incredibly frustrating and feels contrived for obligatory conflict. And that's honestly what a bulk of their relationship throughout the series feels like. There's obligatory jealousy in season four with Sky not trusting Bloom when it comes to Andy, obligatory jealousy when it comes to Elos in season seven, a fucking horse, and obligatory jealousy when it comes to Diospro again in seasons five and eight. Oh my god, can we please stop with villainizing Diospro and just let her move the fuck on? Even the season five amnesia plot feels so unnecessary. It could have been a great conflict introduced to show more adult, real-world issues the girls would have to face post-season four. But instead, it's just a minor hurdle for these two that gets undone halfway through the season. Wonderful. So while I found these two cute earlier on, their love has outstayed its welcome in my eyes, at least the way it's written. Just stop with the annoying jealousy. Just, oh my god, we don't need obligatory hurdles every damn season. Is it that hard to just write a normal couple? Flora and Helia are perhaps the second most underrated couple of the series. Most underrated, soon to be praised. They're both sweethearts, too shy to admit their feelings to each other until Chada gets Flora to get out of her damn shell and speak her truth. It's a cute little storyline for Flora in learning to assert herself and her feelings to the point she's so confident in herself by the end of the season, she makes Helia stop painting and drop his pen. That said, these two don't get much time to shine once they're together. Helia is absent for most of season three and they're not on screen together much in season four either. I do kinda like the conflicts that they tried to introduce in both five and six, with Flora worrying that she's not interesting enough to keep Helia's attention when Princess Crystal comes into the mix, and also with Helia feeling he's not good enough for Flora in season six. My issue comes in the fact that these conflicts are rather shallow. The season six conflict especially isn't explored all that well. Rooted in Helia being bad with taking care of plants and then becoming antagonistic when a piece of ice freezes his heart. Wow, six was weird. And in season seven and eight, there are also conflicts where the two wind up fighting. Ugh, neither is fun to sit through. I do love these two as a couple. I would love to see Helia encouraging Flora to be a bit more artsy, to express herself, and Flora giving Helia ideas for his poetry and art. But unfortunately, they don't get enough time to have their relationship fully fleshed out, and whenever the writers try, usually it's not that great. Stella and Brandon are perhaps the most affectionate couple of the lot. The fact that these two make a game out of who can flirt with the most people, but still know that they're coming home to each other at the end of the day, and also them fighting for their love in season two. 
The Amentia subplot was weird, but Stella and Brandon were the best parts. Stella's like, if you get between me and my man, I will fucking throw you into the sun. Actually, no, I don't need to do that. I can just conjure up a sun and then throw you into that. And weirdly, they did more to talk through their issues on Brandon being made to lie to protect Sky than Bloom and Sky ever did. And it's sweet. It's wonderful to see a couple actually having conversations about their issues. Wow. <laughs> Not to mention Brandon was worried that Stella wouldn't be interested given he isn't a wealthy prince, but rather a humble squire. But Stella is still ride or die for him no matter what. These two are such a wonderful couple and I genuinely love whenever they're on screen together. They do have issues of their own. Season 4's petty squabbles spared almost no one. Including Stella's nonsensical jealousy when Brandon saves Mitzi from the monster pet. Stella needed to do so much work to understand why she reacted that way, but she kind of just doubled down until Brandon's love speech made her go back to him, which... No? And also feels very out of line. Like, y'all had a game of flirting back in season two. And also, Brandon didn't even flirt with Mint. Like, oh good lord. There's also the issue that Stella's character massively regressed in seasons five and six. The two episodes on Solaria in season six make my brain numb. Not only from the profound lack of plot, but also in the fact that it marks the pinnacle of Stella's regression, where she doesn't take her queenly duty seriously. She does make it up to Brandon ultimately, but I am not here for that. Behold, the least problematic and most underrated couple of the franchise. That's right, the nerds have discovered the science of love, and they are happy for it. Back in season one, these two were basically just flirting with each other, but not really aware that they were flirting in the first place. And it wasn't until season two where they had a full conflict that they worked out their issues and finally got together. And that conflict was wonderful because it felt real. It felt authentic to them and their faults. With Tecna's inability to empathize with Timmy, even though she is right to take issue in Timmy's inability to stand his ground, and especially him not being able to talk about his feelings adamantly and hiding behind their techno babble constantly. Once all of this is done, they're so cute. These two are all over each other. No unnecessary drama to be seen. It is absolutely heart-wrenching to see Timmy break down after thinking Tecna has died in season three, and then trying desperately to find and save her. And even while the season five regression for Tecna feels half-hearted in the stereotypical how does nerd romance, it's still endearing because they're both trying their best for each other, and then they realize, wait, we're good enough as we are, and we love each other for who we are. Still a good message. We love to see it. So all in all, put some damn respect on this ship's name. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Okay, let's be real. We all knew these two would dominate the list. They're a fan favorite for a reason. They're a cute couple and they deserved the damn world. Naboo was a fun introduction back in season three, with a plot twist that he and Aisha were actually engaged and neither wanted to be forced to marry someone they didn't love, only to discover, wait, no, I actually kind of like this person. That scene in season three where Naboo has like snuck aboard the owl and then Aisha finds him in the storage and tackles him and he's like, you have my foot. And then they accidentally get locked into the cell together and Naboo starts talking about the bands he likes and Aisha's <laughs> and Aisha corrects him on lyrics and then they start talking about Oh, it's so cute. Oh, it's so why isn't that the standard? Why can't that be the standard? Aisha is apprehensive to let Naboo in, and then warms up to him as they bond over their similar experiences being isolated as kids. Weirdly, he was only in the ending gala in the first movie, but season four is where Naboo really got to shine. Oh my god, he's such a sweetheart, being fully trusting and affectionate towards Aisha, and also supportive to the specialists, especially Riven, when he's being an idiot. Oh, I love them. I love these bros. 
Oh, also forget to mention this, but like the fact he actively cares about like the other members of the group because they are Aisha's friends and therefore he cares about them also. Like when he sees Musa hurt at the base of the Red Tower, he goes to check on her. Like, oh, oh, Naboo. Oh, I love you. A notable critique of their romance in season four is that Aisha seemingly loses herself in her relationship with Naboo and Naboo is apparently too perfect of a character. Once uninterested in men or romance, suddenly she's over the moon for Naboo and ready to marry him and move to Earth just to be with him. And Naboo seems to be a Gary Stew of sorts, warping Aisha's personality. And while I can understand that, that's never how I interpreted it. It might just be me, but it seemed that Aisha was just happy to find a partner who understood her and she naturally became more affectionate as a result and every relationship is different and moves at a different pace, so I don't know if I would agree that they got engaged too soon. And the Naboo is too perfect argument? Why can't, why can't we just have good men? <laughs> what I do definitely have an issue with is Naboo's death and how Aisha was handled as a result. I've discussed this before, but Naboo was the only main male character who was dark-skinned and Indian-coded. I'm not as sure as referring to him as black, given the Indian coding, but that's on the table potentially for discourse. I not, I don't know. At the very least, he was the only dark skinned guy. So having him die, especially after only one season of really knowing him felt so wrong, especially seeing how happy they were together talking about their future only to have it ripped away is a reinforcement of this idea that if you're dark skinned, you ain't getting a happy ending. I don't think that was the intention, but the impact is what really matters. This is a common trend in media as a whole, and Winx Club has always had issues when it comes to depicting black characters and characters of color. It reads as though the reason Naboo was made so perfect, and the reason he and Aisha were so happy together talking about their future, was to set up for this tragedy, which is incredibly insidious. Like, as a writer, I get it, but don't do that to like the only black couple, please. Please don't do that. Do it to Bloom and Sky. Do it to them. Now, just because of all these issues doesn't mean that we can't enjoy the show, but we also should acknowledge these issues so that we can demand better representation because we all deserve to see reflections of ourselves in all sorts of situations across the spectrum, not just made to see ourselves only suffering and having happiness ripped away from us. So you heard it from me. Naboo deserved better. Aisha and Naboo deserved better. They would have already been at the top of the list before, but this reason is especially why. As we've seen, some of the relationships in the show aren't all that well written. Romance can be a great way to explore different themes and characters as they grow and change. We can see some of that in the better couples and even some of the poorer relationships like Musa and Riven, or even Aisha and Roy. If you want to incorporate romance into your story, then make sure you know what your goal is going in, and also don't be afraid of letting those dynamics grow and change just like they do in life. And also, please don't inject arbitrary conflict and toxicity and petty behavior just because you think that's what you need to do. Don't do that unless the couple is meant to either talk about it and work through it and do better or realize that they're not good for each other. Oh yeah, another thing, have them have actual conversations. Please God, please God, talk about your issues openly, please. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more content like this from me, then be sure to not only check out my other videos, but also to subscribe and ring that bell for notifications because YouTube hates creators. Also, please consider if you're willing and able pledging your support to myself and the channel over on Patreon. I'm Unicorn of War, and once again, Naboo deserved 